trajectory for the rest of the course here. I guess, uh, what is this, April 30th now? Um, okay. So we've got uh, two weeks, and then the final is that next week. And the way that UCCS does finals, I'm still pretty new here, I think, that finals week, there aren't any classes that, that week at all. So really, we have these two weeks to finish everything up. So all I'm trying to do is, is do chapter five, the two parts of the chapter that I think are relevant and useful. And that just means two sections. And one of them I'm going to get done today, for sure. So all we have to do, basically, is finish up one more section in review. And that, that's it, OK? Um, so um, having said that, I'll start giving you some idea of what to study for the final, you know, what the final is going to be comprised of in terms of old exams and definitions and all that kind of stuff. So you have some idea of where to begin. I'm probably not going to do that today, but try to remind me if I forget. We'll, I'll start talking about that on Thursday, okay? So then you should have plenty of time to get an idea of what, what to be, look back over. Okay. Sounds like loud people out here. Okay. All righty. So, um, yeah, so basically here's what we're going to do. It's nice and compact this time. Um, let's see. Okay, sorry, Joe, I didn't mean to close the door on you there. Um, this is, uh, oops, let's see. That's what I need. Oh, I'm screwing it all up. Okay. Um, there we go. Section 5.2. 5.1 is just a history lesson about there's this geeky guy <laughs> in Ma who got all excited about all this stuff. And just like all these guys back then, you know, they died of tuberculosis when they time they were 26. Uh, they don't tell you that, though. Um, so there's my augmentation to 5.1. And so we're going to move on just to 5.2. Uh, for Ma's... Little Theorem is what this is called. He didn't have any pets. Nobody loved him, so he just throwing, calling it little made him feel better. Um, okay. So, actually, yes. I mean, there's, he's, he's, he's actually in the number theory community sort of famous about, there's another theorem called Fermat's Last Theorem, which maybe some of you have heard of before. That was much, much, it's, it's much bigger than this theorem, so hence... This is the little one. Um, and it basically just says this. It just says, let P be a prime A an integer and suppose that um, P does not divide A. Okay, that's, that's the assumption. So this is very important that you don't forget this. P does not divide A. Then, uh, I'm gonna, okay, this P is going to cut this off. A to the power P minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod P. Okay. Uh, the statement's very simple. In fact, the proof is actually pretty simple. And so what, what this says is, of course, you can already translate this yourselves at this point. It just says that if you take an integer a, and P's, this is important, that p does not actually divide a, p is not a factor of a, then if you raise that number to the p minus 1 power and subtract 1, p divides that number. Okay. So this is the first kind of, uh, I don't know, I think sort of surprising results um, in the book, which is why I really wanted to get to this. And after we do this, I'll just do a couple of examples for you, and then I'm going to do, um, you know, like I've been trying to do, some, some stuff related to your homework. So what we're going to do is just uh, suppose that, again, I'm, I'm not saying that what, where these things live, but we're just going to suppose that P does not divide A. Of course, A is an integer. P does not divide A. And let's consider P 
the integers um, a, 2a, 3a, and just we're just going to keep on going down until we get to p minus 1 times a. Okay, so here's, here's the idea. This is actually not very hard. The proof of this theorem is not, is not hard, and this is the main object that you're going to be looking at in here. Okay, so I'm going to make a couple claims. So claim one, yes, yes. When you say claim, mm -hmm. how is that different from the supposition? Uh, well, what I, okay, so if, if I say claim, what, what I really mean is I'm sort of, I'm proving something for you. A supposition, depending on the context, could mean this is one of your hypotheses in the statement of your theorem. Um, all I'm saying is, w when I say claim, I'm just going to show you something that has to, that's true, and then we're going to use it later on. Okay. Uh, so the first claim is that um, none of the above integers In, okay, just to be clear, I'm just going to make a little box here. That's what I mean by the above integers. I mean all of these guys right here. None of the above integers um, are congruent to 0 mod p. Oops. Yeah, sorry, Joe. A, 2A, 3A, 4A, all the way down to P minus 1 times A. That's fine. I'm yes. Just making sure I'm following. Yes. None of these are congruent to 0 mod P. So why not just say that none of them are divisible by P is the same thing? Yeah, it is. It's saying the same thing. Um, I'm just going to use this congruence language because it's going to come up here in a second. But yes, it's, it's exactly the same thing. So why is that true? Well, um, so suppose one of them was congruent to zero mod p. Let, let's say, suppose, you know, I have to do this in general now, okay? Um, but let's just suppose that i a is congruent to zero mod p, um, where i is an integer, right? And, well, what are the possible coefficients in front of the a's, right? There's the first one is a, so i could be one. And the biggest it could be would be p minus 1, right? You see where I'm getting that? It just comes from the coefficients in front, right? They range from 1 to p minus 1. Well, then, as Nick pointed out, i a congruent to 0 mod p just means that p divides i times a, right? That's what it means, okay? p divides i a. All right. So we're trying to get a contradiction here, and so, yes. Is it what I think it is? Because p, p divides i a, and p has to divide a. Is that right? Uh, say that again. Since, uh, what you, since we're saying suppose p does not divide a, but it's right. Again. Y basically, yeah. Um, so, so the way to say it is, our supposition is that p doesn't divide a, and if, if remember, if a prime divides a product of two integers, it has to divide one of them, right? So since it doesn't divide this one, it has to divide this one, but there's no way it can do that because it's, it's too small in some sense, right? It's between 1 and p, p minus 1, so it couldn't be divisible by p. That's the idea. Okay? Since p does not divide a, uh, I'll write this out. Um, we are forced... to conclude that p divides i because of a property of primes that we've known for a while. But this is impossible since like I said, i is sort of too small. 1 is less than or equal to i. 
which is less than or equal to p minus 1. So that can happen, right? Make sense? Okay, so we got a contradiction. That means what we assumed um, was true is actually not true, so this proves the claim. Yeah? Just for, uh, you know, cover all bases here, um, that last part, is that sufficient to say that, you know, i is less than or equal to p minus 1 and p minus 1 is less than p, or that's kind of like a duh? Oh, okay. Um, so i is less than or equal to p minus 1, and, oh, you're, you're saying is the other part redundant that 1 is less than or equal to i? You mean? No, no, like at the, at the end of that, should you also have to say that p minus 1 is obviously less than p, because initially we're comparing i to p, not i to p minus 1. Right, right, right. Yeah, I mean, that. yeah, you're right. But it just sort of, um, yeah, I mean, and that's, that's a good question. Is what do you leave out? I mean, how obvious it does, does it have to be before you actually don't state it, you know? Um, yeah, I mean, in this case, it's, it's just, again, because it's positive and it's smaller than P, so, so P can't. That goes back to a theorem from way back in Chapter 1, I think. But, but yeah, I mean, really, it's the, it's the fact that, that I is positive and strictly less than P, so P cannot divide it because they're, they're both positive. Okay, so claim two is that um, none of the integers in um, box, hopefully this makes sense, so I'm writing on a slant here, um, are, try to correct that here, congruent mod p. Okay. So let's, again, and I'm running out of room, so I'm going to try to get this in here. Let's suppose not. Let's suppose that, say, you know, i times a is congruent to j times a mod p. Okay. Well, okay, then, and now we're going to actually use something that we've, we've already known um, to shorten the proof a little bit. The book, I don't think, went into this, but I'm, I'm going I'm to quote this because this is something that you should have in the back of your mind to work on problems. This can certainly help you out. What can we do here? Well, there is something we can do to this congruence to simplify it a little bit. What's that? The A's, yes. And the reason for that is because a and P are relatively prime, right? If P does not divide A, they have to be relatively prime. They have to, because otherwise, think, think about it, okay, if I'm missing anyone. If P doesn't divide A, A is an integer, P and A are, have to be relatively prime. So what's, what's, what are the only possibilities for the GCD of P and A? One and P, because it has to divide P. But it can't be P, because then P would divide A, and we're assuming P doesn't divide A, so it has to be one, right? So that's why they're relatively prime. And so by, and I'm not going to keep writing this down, but hopefully you're all with me now. Then we can cancel, as Nick said, we can cancel the A out, okay, and reduce this congruence. I'm not going to quote the theorem now, but. Um, okay, so then I is congruent to J mod P. Okay. And this I'm going to gloss over just, just a bit because I'm not that interested in it. Um, so what does that mean? That means that P divides I minus J. Okay, well, what do we know about I and J? So I and J are between 1 and P minus 1. And just, just try to think about this. Hopefully, if you just maybe think about this geometrically, this will make sense. I'm not going to write out too much here because I feel like I'm starting to split hairs now because I want, I want to really get to the more complicated stuff here. You've got two different numbers, i and j, that are both between 1 and p minus 1. What happens if you subtract them? Well, okay, let's just suppose that i is bigger. Let's just suppose. It doesn't really matter. But i is bigger than j, and they're both between 1 and p minus 1. When you subtract them, you're going to get something that's between 0, strictly between 0 and p minus 1, when you subtract those two numbers. Okay? If you think, think about it. I mean, just, just, just think, you know... 2 and 7, well, what happens when you subtract? You're going to get 5, okay? So you're going to end up with something that 
Re now, regardless, one, but maybe the, the, the smaller one comes first. You know, maybe you're taking 2 minus 9 or something like that. But the point is, hopefully you'll buy this, an absolute value, because i and j are squeezed between 1 and p, strictly, uh, well, between 0 and p, and strictly between 0 and p, um, when you subtract, you're, in absolute value, you're still going to be smaller. You're still going to be small. You're going to be strictly between 0 and p in absolute value because if your i and j are switched too, too small together. So when you subtract, it can't be divisible by p because that difference would have to be too big. That's, that's the idea, roughly. Okay? Okay, so I mean, here's the idea, roughly. Okay, just just in case you you want to see something like this, let's just suppose one is less than or equal to i, which is less than j, uh, which is less than p, right? Well, what happens if I take i minus j? Well, we're not going to worry so much about the the 1 minus j here, but, um, well, okay. Let's just subtract, I and mean, we can certainly subtract j from all these, right? So, 1 minus j is less than or equal to i minus j, which is what? Less than 0, okay, right? Which is less than p minus j. And actually, you can show that i minus j then has to be between 0 and minus p. So again, it's just it's too small to be divisible by p. So that's all I'm going to say about that. Well, okay, if you go back over here, um, so j, okay, I'm just answering his question. j is certainly less than p plus 1, right? For sure. That's for sure, right? Because j is some number between 1 and p minus 1. So, um, let's see, um, uh, that's not what I wanted to say, sorry. Um, so, um, so what do we know about J? So, yeah. Yeah, okay. So no, this this is all this is all amounts to. So J is less than P plus one. Okay, so um, from here we get um, Yeah, so um, Minus, if you move everything over here, you get minus p then is less than uh, 1 minus j. Okay, I know this is getting squished. This is definitely true. Um, where am I at? j is definitely less than p plus 1 because j is one of these numbers here. Okay, it's actually less than p even, but okay. But if j is less than p plus 1, then just move the minus p over here and the minus j over here, and you get minus p is less than 1 minus j. Then once you've got that, then you've got minus p, so, so then you've got i minus j squeezed be, between minus p and p. Okay, so the only way it can be divisible by p is if it's zero. That's, that's it. Yeah? I'm trying to get my head around why this last bit is necessary. Um, it seems to me like it would be sufficient to say if i and j are congruent mod p, either i equals j, in which case no problem, or they differ by a factor of p and we don't have that many but that's exactly the thing I'm trying to prove oh. rigorously here. I'm trying to answer his, his question. Um, I, an argument like that be good enough? Yeah, but I mean, you'd still need to, to, to demonstrate that, that too, which is what I'm trying to say here. And this, the minus p less than, than 1 minus j, 
is where I, I, I throw this in here. So minus p is less than 1 minus j, and then you've got 1, or sorry, you've got i minus j strictly squeezed between minus p and p. So it's got to be 0. Anyways, all right. All right. I, I don't want to focus on this <laughs> anymore, but that's the idea. Okay, can I go on to a new page now? Okay, so. So now the thing to note is that this is kind of the cool part of the proof. The integers um, a, 2a, 3a, on down to p minus 1 times a are non-zero, right? I, I showed you that none of them are, are zero mod p, and mutually incongruent mod p. So, what does this say? Um, First of all, if you take all the integers mod p, how many distinct integers are there reduced modulo p? There are exactly p of them, right? 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way down to p minus 1. p is congruent to 0, right? p plus 1 is congruent to 1. There are exactly p of them. So I just showed you that none of these are 0, and they're all mutually incongruent mod p. That, in, in other words, neither of them is, and I showed you this, neither of them is congruent mod p. And so... A has to be, so listen to what I'm saying. I'm just going to say this, and I'm not going to write it down because it's just going to get too long. A has to be congruent. It's certainly congruent to something mod P, right? So every integer is congruent to something mod P. It's the remainder when you divide it by P, right? A is congruent to something mod P. That's not zero, right? 2A is also congruent to something mod P, but it has to be congruent to something different mod P. Otherwise, those two guys would be congruent, and I just proved that they're not. So the point is, all of these guys, all of these p minus 1 um, uh, scalar multiples of a are congruent to different things mod p, and none of them are 0. Because I showed you that none of them is, is congruent to the, none of them is congruent to, to each other mod p. So I'm just, okay, I'm just going to say this too. There's a theorem, this goes back into chapter 4. So let's say that a and 3a were both congruent to 5, say mod p. Then there's a theorem that says that, okay, well, a is congruent to 5, and 5 is, I can't remember, a and 3a. Okay, so a is congruent to 5, and 3a is congruent to 5. So we've got a is congruent to 5, and you can flip the congruence around, so 5 is congruent to 3a, and by transitivity, a is congruent to 3a, which is what we just proved isn't possible. That's why they all have to be congruent to different things. Okay? So what do we know? Um, and I want you to think about this for a second. All right, this, this might require just a little bit of thought, but I, again, I don't want to be too wordy here. Um, a times 2a times 3a on down to p minus 1 times a is congruent to... Um, 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 all the way down to p minus 1. Not necessarily in that order, but by Hang on a second. Ah, mod. Oh, that's, ah, that's bad. Okay. I'm going to try to erase this, but I'm not going to. Um, mod p. There we go. All right. Sorry about that. Well, yeah, I mean, so the, the point is, I think is what you're making here. It's not necessarily the case that a is congruent to 1 and 2a two, two is congruent to 2 and 3a is congruent to 3. That's not necessarily the case. But here's, here's what you, you should keep in mind. And this also comes from a induction and an application. I think, I think it was theorem 4.2, at least it was in section 4.2. 
so, okay, let me, let me just say this. Remember what I said before. A is congruent to one of those numbers, for sure. It's not zero. Remember, none of them are congruent to zero mod P. So A has to be congruent to one of those guys. Maybe it's not one. Maybe it's seven. Who knows, right? Two A is congruent to a different one of those guys, as we were just talking about, right? Three A is congruent to a different one of those guys. How many, how many elements are there here? There are P minus one here. There are P minus one elements here. So they all match up in some way, okay? They all match up. And so because they all match up, remember, this is also a theorem. If A is congruent to B and C is congruent to D, then AC is congruent to BD. You can multiply them together. That was also in theorem 4.2, I believe. So once you have these, these individual congruences, you can literally just multiply them down the, down the line. And that's essentially what we're doing. And we're just using the fact that multiplication is commutative just to write it in the natural order on the right-hand side. OK? Thus, well, let's, let's rewrite the left side, OK? There's a natural way that we can rewrite the left side. Um, all of these terms have an A in them, right? There's P minus 1 of them. So we get A to the P minus 1. What do we have with the numbers? Well, OK, you see what I did? I just, take, I just took all, care of all the A's. But now we still have 2 times 3 times 4 times 5 down to P minus 1, which, which is P minus 1 factorial. Right? You might say, well, but there's no 1. But it doesn't matter if there's a 1, right? If you leave the one out and where you put the one on, you get the same thing because you're multiplying by one. Okay? And then, of course, on the other side, we get P minus one factorial mod P. Okay. We're almost done. And. What can we say here? Yes, we can do that. Yes, why can we do that? It is relatively prime to p, right? Okay, and it's it's not because it's not as easy as saying that that p minus one factorial is smaller than p. They, that may not be the case. I mean, if you take five factorial, right? It, it's or five minus one factorial. Okay, 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, that's not smaller than 5. It's still bigger, but you know that, okay, so since somebody, I'm, I'm just I'm right, quizzing you today here, but can somebody tell me why it is that, and remember, in order for this to be relatively prime to P, all we know, need to know is that P doesn't divide it. And then it's automatically relatively prime from what I was saying just a little bit ago. Why can't P divide P minus 1 factorial? That's basically the idea. Yeah. Yeah. Right, 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 yeah. The point is if P divided P minus 1 factorial, remember it's a product, right? P minus 1 times P minus 2 all the way down to 1. So P being prime would have to divide one of them, okay? But if P divided any one of them, that's not possible because that factor is smaller than P. So P can't, so, sorry. So P can't possibly divide it because P is too big. Right? Whatever that number is, P is bigger than it, so P can't divide it. Okay. So, we can now cancel the P minus 1 factorial to get a to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod p. Okay. And I don't want you to forget the assumption in the beginning of the problem was that p does not divide a, remember. That's very important. Oops, that wasn't supposed to be a d. Yeah, sorry. Sorry about that. Mod p. Okay. Yes? Um, sure. Let me uh, just let me kind of do this as an aside over here. Okay. This I think will make it make it simpler. Hopefully, I gave myself enough space. Um, so, for example, why can't you know five divide uh, five minus one, which will be four, right? 
5 can't divide 4 factorial, right? Well, this is the same thing as saying 5 cannot divide 1 times 2 times 3 times 4, right? If so, because of this product, remember 5 will have to divide one of the factors. That's one of the properties of primes, is if a prime divides a product, it has to divide one of the factors. So 5 would have to divide 1, 2, 3, or 4, which it can't because it's just too big, right? So then 5 would divide i for some i between 1 and 4, which is not possible. Okay? All right. Hopefully this is legible here. This is really horrible p, but uh, yeah. Um, so that's what the theorem says. And this is a uh, kind of an interesting uh, trick here. Um, if... Uh, yeah, if we if we had any actual real college bars here, you you could you could impress your friends by whipping out your calculator and saying, "Hey, guess what? I can I can I can show you that uh, you know uh, thirteen to the one hundred and second is divisible by uh, minus one is divisible by one hundred and three. I'm like, well, how would you know that? And they can ask you these questions, and you seem like a genius. Um, it's not going to really no one's no. One, no, <laughs> it's not. That's what he still uh, does. No, if it was that easy, believe me, I would I would do it. But it doesn't it doesn't work that easy. Um, so no, but in in actual, I mean, in all honesty, it is kind of cool that this is true. You take a number that's not divisible by, by p, and for some reason, if you raise it to the p minus one power and subtract one, it is divisible by p. That's a sort of a non-obvious fact. Um, Um, oh, okay, I see. Well, it sort of um, sort of falls apart right away um, because if you took that away, then, for example, just plug in p for a here. Then certainly p. It's not the case that p doesn't divide a. P does divide a, but then p will divide a to the p. I mean, just just imagine replacing a with p. Okay, then p does divide a in that case. Then p is definitely not going to divide this because this will be already be a multiple of p. And then when you subtract 1, there's no way that p will divide it. Yeah. Okay. And that same argument actually can be used for any, any value of a that's divisible by p. You just replace it with pk or something, and you can see that it's not going to divide that to the p minus 1 minus 1. Okay, so the corollary to this... And let's see, I may not get as far today as I wanted to, but that's, that's okay. I mean, I'll basically get, at least get through this section, so then we're going to have plenty of time for the, for the next section in review. So corollary is actually very nice, very succinct, very easy to state, and that is that um, for any integer a, um, let's see, what is the corollary? Um, a to the p is congruent to a mod p. Yes, for any integer a. And you can try some test cases here and just plug in the simple ones like 0 and 1 and you can see that they both work, right? In fact, it works for everything. P is prime still, yes. P is still prime. And so the proof here is, is really pretty simple. So the, the proof goes like this. Case 1, P does not divide A, then by, um, I'm going to abbreviate this, hopefully you don't mind, FLT for Ma's little theorem, right? Um, A to the P minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod p, right? Okay, that's what we just proved. So, and this is also something, and this you should have known going to the next exam, you can always multiply any congruence by any, any number you want. It preserves it. Okay, so, hence, multiplying through by a, that's, if you want to write that down, I get a to the p is congruent to a mod Okay, case two, P uh, does divide A, 
Okay. Well, um, now we're just going to... Uh, what is it we need to show? I just want to remind you what you need to prove. We need A to the P is congruent to A mod P. Okay. Um, uh, all right, now you might think I'm being lazy, but I'm just going to write obvious here, and there's a reason why I do that. Um, here, you can write it down. You can write it down. I'm going to tell you. Okay, I'm just running out of room. And I want you to think about it. Think about this. Okay? Case two is that P divides A. He's a factor of A. If P divides A, do you think that P is going to divide A to the P? Okay? Just, just think about what this is. Just think about it written out. A times A times A times A times A, P times. Well, to replace every A with PK, right? PK times PK times PK times. P is certainly going to divide it, for sure. And if P divides A, then P divides A, and therefore P will divide their difference. If it divides both things, it divides their difference. Done. That's it. That's all there is to it. That makes sense? Okay. I didn't want to write all that out, but hopefully that's not too hard. Okay. So now... I'm going to do an example, and uh, yeah, probably what I'll get to. Tell, please tell me if you, if you need a little more more time on this before I go to the next page. Okay, so I'm going to get, give you an example that has a flavor of of your homework, and then I'm going to do one more lemma, which might be used in the homework. I'm not sure, but just to be on the safe side, I'm going to go ahead and go through it. Or at least I'll tell you what it is. I may not prove it, but it's the proofs in the book. Okay, so here's an example. It's to verify that 5 to the 38th power is congruent to... 4 mod 11. Okay. Now, the direction is actually going to say more um, like use from Ma's last theorem to do this. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, not for Ma's last theorem, definitely not. For Ma's little theorem, yes. Okay, so. Um, Here's the thing to do. And again, the principle is very similar in a sense to what you were doing before. If we want to, okay, we want to use Fermat's little theorem to do this. Okay, so what's the modulus? It's 11. So remember what Fermat's little theorem says. It says that P doesn't divide A, then A to the P minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod P. So that knowing what the P is and what the power is should be immediate. It's whatever the modulus is. That's what you should be starting with. I mean, at least that, that should be your first strategy, okay? So, and I want you to think about this, okay? 5 to the 11 minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod 11. Okay? So the A is 5, right? The P is 11, and P does not divide A. In other words, 11 does not divide 5, right? I'll, I'll write that down if it helps. The A is 5 in this case, right? The P is 11. And just note, I'll just put this in brackets, um, P does not divide A in this case, right? Okay. So what does that tell us? Well, let's, we can write this a little bit nicer, right? So this is... 5 to the 10th is congruent to 1 mod 11. Okay. Can you understand what happened to the 5 to the 30 second? 38. 
Okay, we're, uh, yeah, we're going to try to get there. That's our whole goal is to get there. Okay, and you'll see, you'll see how this works here in a second. This is, this is just one way of going about doing it. So we've got 5 to the 10th. We want to get it up to 5 to the 38th, right? So, well, what can we do? The nice thing is that, and, and of course, as you remember, what our goal was is to get ones popping out. We've got one on one side. So whatever we, if we raise, first of all, we can raise both sides to whatever power we want. And the right side's always going to be one, for sure. And we want to get 5 to the 38th. So um, it stands to reason maybe that the, okay, and this is the way you should be thinking. You might think oh, I'm going to just raise both sides to the third power. That'll get me up to the 30th. But you still have a lot more powers left. You're better off raising both sides to the fourth power because 5 to the 40th is a lot closer to 5 to the 38th. And then work from there. Okay? So, and I'll write this out. So 5 to the 10th to the 4th is congruent to 1 to the 4th mod 11. Right? Okay? All right, so now we've got 5 to the 40th is congruent to, of course, I don't need the fourth power here, 1 mod 11. Okay, well, what can I do from here? I'm kind of bigger than I want to be. Okay, I want, I want to know what 5 to the 38th is. So what I can do, though, since I'm not that far away, what I can do is just take 5 to the 38th out and then I've got a 5 squared left, right? Make sense? Okay, so we're almost done. Okay, so I'm just going to do this in one step here. Let's look at the 5 squared. It's 25, right? What's 25 mod 11? Three, right. If you want possible. Right. Right. Sure. There are other ways you could do it too. So now let's look at where we're at. Where do we want to get? We want to get five to the thirty eight congruent to four mod eleven. So here's what I'd like. What I'd like to have happen is if I just multiply this congruence through by four, I'd like this three times four to go to one. Then I get exactly what I want. But it does go to 1, because it's exactly 1 bigger than 11. Now we're done. OK? So this, I'm going to circle this up here. And just keep in mind, we're, we're, everything's modulo 11, right? This is equal to 1, mod 11. OK? So then 5 to the 38 now is congruent to 4, mod 11. OK, so here's what I'm going to do. Here's the last thing I'm going to do, OK? And again, this is just for the sake of time. You are certainly welcome to use this fact. I think I did. I, I guess I, I forgot my book. Um, everybody have this down? OK. Um, the book kind of lists this as a lemma, so I'm just going to call this just a lemma. Um, suppose. Uh, let's see. Actually, this, I don't want to. I don't want to get this wrong here. Actually, do I have it written? Um, hang on a second. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. I've got it. I've, I've st still got it here. I'm just not going to write the proof out. Suppose that P and Q are distinct primes. with a to the p 
congruent to A mod Q and A to the Q congruent to A mod P. Then A to the PQ is congruent to A mod PQ. And the proof's actually really easy, really, but I'm not going to do it. So, um, what I'm going to do instead to finish the day, we may actually finish a little early today, uh, is to do an example. Um, first, before I do that, let me, before I forget, let me give you homework from this section, okay? So, this is 5-2. We'll have to talk about, of course, when this is due. Um, so, let's see. So we have two, two more sections. Probably you would, wouldn't like to have them both do at the final because then you're not going to get any feedback really on the, on the problem. So um, we've got, okay, here's what we're going to do. So we still have this week and next week, right, for the final. Um, and because I'll be talking about a bunch more problems on Thursday, this assignment will be due a week from today, one week, okay? Okay, so one, two, four, six, seven, ten, eleven. Okay. Okay, so now what I'm going to do, start off with, this is the last part of the lecture for today. We'll do number 2B. Okay. Now, some of them do have, you know, quite a few parts, but once you get the hang of this, you're not doing a lot of proofs. You're just kind of, you know, modifying congruences until things come out. It's, it's not really that bad, okay? I'll show you what I mean with this example. So 2B, and it says, um, and most of these just boil down to Fermat's last theorem, and they, re they really do. So if the GCD of A and 35 is equal to 1, Show that. Um, I think this is 2B, right? Oh, is that what 2B? Oh, so 2, 2A is the GCD of A and 35 being 1. Show that A to the 12th can grow into 1 mod 35. Okay, sorry. It's 2A then. Yeah. 2A. Okay, so here's what you're going to do. Um, all right. Um, keep in mind some of your old tricks, okay? And th these will help you. Um, going, first of all, I want to point this out, right? You can't directly go to Fermat's last theorem. You, you want to prove this, right? But Fermat's last theorem has to do with congruences mod p, right? This is not a prime, okay? You definitely shouldn't be thinking I apply Fermat's last theorem to, to this. You can't do it. But what you can do is break 35 up into the product of two, of two primes, right? 7 times 5. And then you can start thinking about Fermat's last theorem. Then you put everything together at the end. Um, so I will write that first. Just to make sure that you're aware of this. Note that 35 is definitely not prime. Okay. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to show um, two things. Okay, so the first... Um, is that a to the, and I'll, if you're wondering where I'm getting this, I'll explain it to you all in the end. 
a to the twelfth is congruent to one mod seven. Okay, that's the first thing we're going to show. Okay. Uh, you'll see in a second. And then, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go through this and I'm going to try everything in the, at the very end. And then if you still have questions, then I'll try to address those. I think once you see how it all ties together, I think it'll make sense at the very end. Okay? Well, okay, now think about this. If we were to apply for Ma's last theorem here, there's, this, okay, so this is prime, right? So if we're going to apply for Ma's last theorem, it's going to say if the other condition is met, all we can say is then that a to the 7 minus 1, in other words, a to the 6th, is congruent to 1 mod 7. It doesn't say anything about 12, right? So, there, But there's still something we need to know. This is important. We, in order to even apply the theorem, we need, we need to know that 7 does not divide a. That's one of the conditions on the theorem, remember. Right? a to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod p when p does not divide a. So we need for 7 to not divide a. We have to have that, right? I go back to... Um... Yes. 7 does not divide A. Okay, so otherwise the GCD of A and 35, I'm just trying to get all this in here, would, would certainly be at least 7, right? You see that? If 7 divided A, it also divides 35, so the GCD's got to be at least that, that big. But it's not, it's 1. It's 1, so that can't happen. Wouldn't it also have to be a multiple of 7? Um, 7, no, no. If 7 were to divide that, so, yeah, so if 7... If the GCD were not 1, wouldn't the GCD have to be a multiple of 7? So if 7 were to divide 7, so 7 divides... Were not one, so seven divides we don't know anything about A, really, so the only thing we can say is if 7 actually did divide A, then 7 would divide A in 35, and so then, yes, 7 would have to divide the GCD. The GCD would have to be a multiple of 7, yes. That's right. So, by Fermat's little theorem, right? a to the 7 minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod 7, right? That's exactly what um, Fermat's little theorem says. Okay, we, can, we check the condition, 7's prime, 7 does not divide a, so we get this for sure. And so that says that a to the 6th is congruent to 1 mod 7, right? And now, and this is also a theorem from 4.2, now we can square both sides, okay? To get a to the 12th is congruent to 1 mod 7. Okay, so that took care of the first one, right? Any questions? Okay, so what do we want to do for the second one? Well, it's, it's similar, right? Now we want to show that a to the 12th is congruent to 1 mod 5. Again, note that um, 5 does not divide A, right? Otherwise, the GCD of A and 35 would have to be bigger than or equal to 5, right? 5 divided A, then 5 divides both A and 35 common divisor, so the GCD has to be at least that. The greatest common divisor, of course, has to be at least that. Okay. 
So then it's the same thing. Uh, Fermat's little theorem then implies that, what does it say? It says that a to the 5 minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod 5, right? That's what it says. Right? In other words, a to the 4th is congruent to 1 mod 5. And now you can probably see where we need to go, right? Just cube both sides, right? Cube both sides. I'm running out of room here, but we want to write that in your notes. I'm cubing both sides, just like I squared both sides before. Okay? So this gives me a to the 12th is congruent to 1 cubed, which is 1 mod 5. Here's the punchline then. Now we're, now we're done, okay? Thus, a to the 12th is congruent to 1 mod 35. This is something that we talked about actually before. Um, this is actually one of your homework problems from the last section, remember? There's a problem that said something like, you know, solve 217 is congruent to something mod 300, whatever it was. And the problem said, break it down into these congruent, you know, into these separate congruences. The whole point is, remember that if your moduli are relatively prime, if you have the same congruence, but the moduli are, are, are relatively prime, but those congruences are the same, then you can just multiply all the moduli together into one congruence. And I'm just going to say one thing, last thing about that before we finish. Think about, just because I want you to, rem I want to remind you of this, right? What does this mean? I want you to think about this. This will help you. If you understand it, it will help you make sense out of it later. What does this mean? This means that 7 divides a squared, uh, sorry, this means that 7 divides a to the 12th minus 1. What does uh, this mean? This means that 5 divides a to the 12th minus 1. But since 7 and 5 are relatively prime, their product divides it. That goes way back to a divisibility theorem from a long time ago. So these are the kinds of things that you're doing. You're just playing numbers games again, really. Okay. So I've done a couple of examples for you. I've basically done the whole section. We only have one more to do. Um, so we should have plenty of time to do that and review and do more homework problems. So you really should be in decent shape for the final. Thursday, I'll start trying to tell you more about what to expect on the final exam. Okay. And just FYI, the, the final exam is, is May 16th. So it's Thursday of finals week. So you still have a plenty of time to study for the exam. I believe, please don't quote me until I verify this. I think that the final is from 140 to 410. May 16th in this room. I'm almost positive that's right. It'll, it'll basically be cumulative, but I'm gonna, there are some things I'm going to say about that. But I'll start talking about that on Thursday. So and if, if I had to say, is it cumulative or is it absolutely not cumulative? The answer is it is cumulative. Okay, But you will be given a break in a sense. But we'll, we'll talk about that on Thursday. Yes? Mm-hmm. Okay, this one? 